Good morning and welcome to Live with Lewis for the 27th of October 2005. We're broadcasting to you today from the Dalles Dam at the Dalles, Oregon on the Columbia River, uh, at the, on the Columbia River Gorge. And as you can see there in the distance, uh, quite spectacular. Uh, the overwhelming uh, terrain feature in this area, uh, Mount Hood covered with snow in the distance. And uh, it is really quite a spectacular uh, sight each and every day around this part of the country. And it has been uh, a, a sight and a beacon to us as we've moved down the river over the last week or so. Uh, once again, welcome to Live with Lewis, part of the Lewis and Clark Then and Now broadcast series through the School District of Clayton, made possible by a National Park Service grant in coordination with many federal state and local partners along the trail. We'd like to take a little moment here to do a little administrative work and let folks know that they can send us emails, uh, their questions and comments at Lewis and Clark, L-E-W-I-S-A-N-D-C-L-A-R-K, all one word, Lewis and Clark, at Clayton, C-L-A-Y-T-O-N dot K-12 dot M-O dot U-S. And we look forward to your questions and comments this morning. 200 years ago, the original expedition it was moving down the Snake River and onto the Columbia and ultimately down the Columbia toward the Pacific Ocean. The last time we broadcast to you, we were still at Lewiston, Idaho, and uh, we had just finished making our dugout canoe and had started moving down the Snake at that point. And we're going to show you footage today from the departure of that area, the confluence of the Snake and the Clearwater Rivers. As we made our way down the Snake, uh, 140 miles or so roughly from the confluence of the Snake and the Clearwater to the Columbia River. And as we uh, covered all of that in its entirety with our dugout canoe. And then as uh, we're going to share with you some images of some time we spent at the mouth of the Snake River, particularly time spent with the Wampum tribe. Uh, which is one of the Columbia Plateau tribes that uh, still practices a very traditional cultural lifestyle here in this area. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And uh, then we're going to show you some footage as we move down the Columbia River toward the Dalles and uh, through some very, very historic uh, areas, both for the original expedition and, more importantly, for the Native people who have called this area home for thousands and thousands of years. So we're pleased for you to join us this morning. Again, send your questions and comments to Lewis and Clark at Clayton.K. K12.mo.us, and we'll be following this morning's Live with Lewis broadcast with a video conference, and we hope you can join us for that. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, since the time we saw you last, Lewis and Clark had made their dugout canoes near Orofino, Idaho. They had made their way down the Clearwater and to the confluence of the Snake and the Clearwater and then continued on down. We saw some images of that last time, and so we're going to kind of pick up uh, historically in the timeline from where the original expedition would have been in this uh, two past ensuing weeks. So we left you on the Snake River, and as we continue down the Snake River, it is an incredible area, and we're going to see some footage of that in just a few moments. It is an austere area. It is a high desert area uh, with outstanding, unique, uh, overwhelming uh, uh, topographical terrain features, um, some really awe-inspiring uh, area there, and an area known as the Columbia Plateau all down through there. Uh, this is an area that Lewis and Clark probably would have essentially felt as if they had gone to another planet. And indeed, for us, coming down the river in a canoe, it was very much the same. It is truly otherworldly for those of us who are most familiar with uh, the eastern United States and, and other parts of the United States besides uh, that area there along the Snake River. Uh, that area 200 years ago was, uh, had, had uh, fishing villages all along it. There were uh, uh, native people who had called that home for many, many years. Most of them were sort of the center people, as it were, between the Nimipu or the Nez Perce and the tribes of the, of the mouth of the, uh, of the Columbia near the Pacific Ocean. These tribes were very much engaged in uh, both cultural exchange as well as commercial trade between those upland tribes and the ocean tribes. And so it was a dynamic area 200 years ago as it still is today. Now 200 years ago the Snake River was flowing extremely quickly. Lewis and Clark talk about the fact that it was running, the canoes were able to run faster or swifter than any horse could run was one of the quotes from the journals. And, uh, and that would have been uh, true. They were making great time. We were able to average about 27 miles a day ourselves, and that was on this, this new river, as it were, a river that is now impounded water, water that is held back by dams, a series of dams along the way. In fact, some of the highest dams in the world are there, 100-foot drop at each of the four dams on the Snake River, and we're going to show you some footage of that as we move through. 
But it's important to understand psychologically where the original expedition might have been at this point. First of all, we know going back a, a little bit on the timeline that when they came down out of the mountains, they, they were sick, their resources were depleted, and they had been befriended and, and really uh, helped to simply survive, let alone continue their mission, um, by the native peoples that they had encountered, the Nimipu in particular, the Nez Perce, when they came down out of the mountains. But that continues all the way down the Snake River. They have very little left in the way of trade goods. Their clothing is starting to really show the wear of the trail. They are physically exhausted, probably psychologically exhausted as well. And here they enter into a place that looks like nothing that they have encountered before, with a people who, who live a lifestyle that is completely foreign to them uh, from anything that they had experienced on the plains, anything that they had experienced, even uh, with the Shoshone and the Nimipu. This is a fundamentally different way of life in a different part of the world, not simply the United States or North America, as we would think of it today, but just a fundamentally different place on the face of the earth with a culture that is unlike what they were used to with the buffalo culture. This is a culture that is largely centered around fishing, and in particular, the salmon. Of course, the diet of these native people was not restricted to, uh, to fish. They, they had a host of other food items that they gathered, and in some cases actually uh, grew in an agricultural sense. And these were well-established villages with very complex and sophisticated societies. And Lewis and Clark uh, had an opportunity... There, and by the way, that was not Bison who kicked the camera that time. That was Jim. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, um, they, they had a really unique experience as they moved through this area, down ultimately into a progressively more and more populated areas as they uh, reached the mouth of the Snake River and then uh, as they descended the Columbia uh, River Valley. A, a rich and vibrant society, but something very different than they had experienced before. So to help give you some insight into that, we're going to take some footage, look at some footage now over the last last couple of weeks as we made our way down the Snake and Columbia River, and I'd ask you to think about what the original expedition must have thought as they moved through this landscape, so unlike anything that they had seen before. Jim? When we left you last, we were on the river, and here you see us continuing. Uh, we're at one of the, the fishing uh, areas, the uh, commercial or recreational fishing areas along the river there, and you see us making our way along in the dugout canoe, and you can see just how this landscape is so very different than, than much of what we'd seen before. Uh, there are times that it reminds us of the hills of South Dakota, and yet uh, this flowing river, and it does have some current to it, it can, moves through it in a, in a way that gives it a life uh, very unlike anything else. And there you see us continuing on with the dugout uh, each day. We're going to just let these roll through. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very un uh, unoccupied place at this point. Uh, there are very few communities or towns along the Snake River today. And uh, mostly we were by ourselves. In fact, we were, we were uh, essentially by ourselves making our way down this river, uh, approximately 140 miles. And uh, very few uh, barges made their way past, and uh, hardly any recreational traffic. And, of course, uh, we were the only dugout that uh, was out there. We kept looking. And uh, well, that's an interesting point, uh, that we keep looking for dugouts, because we're going to find some here shortly as we make our way down to the Columbia. Here you see us locking through the Little Goose Dam. And there in the distance is a horse on a hill, and that's the hill he's on. And you can see uh, how vast this area is with that horse as a, as a measure of perspective. We start to see some tourist boats coming up, some cruise boats and of course the train railroad industry in this area is uh, ha goes hand in hand with the river traffic and uh, here's one of the unique little spots along the way a little fishing basin that uh, we actually had to go through a tunnel to get back to uh, again as you can see a very very austere place and uh, and very little uh, development other than farming you see some vast wheat fields uh, there's orchards in this area as we get to the lower Snake River, and it's a largely agricultural area up on top of these hills, and uh, these reservoirs below provide the shipping capabilities that move those, uh, those goods, those natural resources to market, the food and, uh, and lumber and other things that travel up and down the Columbian Snake Rivers. And there you can see uh, how devoid of trees it is, and that's an important thing to understand as well as we uh, we place ourselves uh, in the mines. There's the orchards of the original expedition. They're moving through this area that has very little wood, 
And, of course, these, these uh, apple trees and other orchards there are artificial today, but very little wood to be found in this area, which made just simple things like cooking and heating for them uh, difficult to do as they made their way down the river. And here you see us approaching the Tri-Cities area near the mouth of the, uh, the, mouth of the Snake River. There's uh, Mike Clark, who one of the builders of the boat, myself there, and as we continue to move down the river, it's about three and a half miles an hour. We're making our way to Pasco, uh, Washington at this point, where uh, we're going to be uh, reaching the Columbia River. And unbeknownst to us, as we made our way down there, some folks were uh, looking out for us. There was a cruise ship, and we start to see some sailing vessels, and it's becoming very quickly a more uh, populated and developed area. And here we approach the Ice Harbor Dam on what turned out to be a cold and windy day as we enter the dam. And uh, lo and behold, on the other side of this dam that we're secured to there, this lock wall, rather, as we go through, and there you see the water spilling in through the locks, and the lock is opening up, and we uh, come out of the Ice Harbor Dam into essentially the Columbia River. The Columbia River backs up to the Ice Harbor Dam there. Uh, there's no dams between Ice Harbor and the mouth of the Colum and the the Columbia, rather the mouth of the Snake. And uh, we're getting into the heavy shipping area now, and the waters are much rougher. We're dealing at this point with regular three to four. Uh, foot swells, and you can see the wind farm there where the large windmills capture the wind for energy, and uh, that's really a hallmark of this area is the wind there. Churchill Clark on our chase boat there carrying our colors as we make our way in, the Coast Guard escort there, and an exciting thing happens at this point. We had been looking for dugouts, and as we reached the mouth of the Snake River, we were met by two dugouts that had recently been made by the Wanapum tribe. Uh, which is a, uh, a tribe that has uh, called this area home for many thousands of years. There you see their reconstructions of their traditional longhouses. There's uh, Pat Wayne, and, uh, his, and uh, that's uh, Rex Buck's son, uh, Clayton. And there you see us posing for a picture with some of the members of the Wampum tribe, a tribe that uh, lives up near Priest Rapids, uh, in Washington now on the Yakima River, and these folks extended tremendous hospitality to us. We want to thank them. Uh, they not only shared their, they allowed us to stay in their longhouse while we were there, they fed us repetitively, and they invited us to their homes in Priest Rapids. And, and uh, besides sharing with us food and camaraderie and that sort of thing, they shared the stories of their people, and we really appreciate being taken in and, and uh, made to feel as if we were part of the community while we passed through that area. And there you see uh, Ron, one of our new members there, spending some time with uh, Pat, uh, talking about the addle addle and some of the traditional skills. Rex Buck there, talking about salmon drying. And uh, we ended up having a tremendous experience with them and uh, learning all sorts of things here about how to make rope in a traditional way out of local uh, plants. Some of the local kids, we had a, a group of uh, folks who were physically uh, challenged there come down and had an opportunity to get in the canoe and, and uh, try to paddle it. And, of course, many of the local folks had an opportunity to paddle with us as well when we were in that area for a couple of days. And here you see the unique architectural style of these tool mat homes, uh, both the teepee-type construction as well as the longhouse. And there's a salmon drying rack where uh, traditionally the salmon would be dried as the season's catch was made in pre preparation for goods for the winter. We're doing a little work on the dugout here to get it ready for the Columbia, and here's another couple of good shots of the inside of that longhouse. A unique architectural style and a tremendous place. We really enjoyed staying there. This is the wash in the middle of the longhouse, a place used for ceremonies and a, a cooking area and other things. We spent some time in Priest Rapid, as I mentioned, with the Wanapum at their current longhouse there. And uh, then the next morning, we set sail. We took off, and the Wanapum put their canoes, first ones they've had in the water since 1961, on the water with us. And together, we paddled out with Rex Buck, uh, the tribal elder there and chief of the tribe, singing a traditional paddle song for us as we made our way out into the Columbia River with the Coast Guard's help, keeping an eye on us to make sure everything was safe and secure, We're working very closely with the United States Coast Guard on our descent now of the Columbia River. And uh, there you saw a shipwreck and some ships moving by. This area near the Wallula Gap, very dangerous area, high winds, and this is sort of the head of the gorge where the wind comes shooting out at the other end, and uh, it is really an, uh, a, a powerful, powerful force there. The, the wind in, along this area is just tremendous. The wind was so bad, in fact, that we were actually forced to portage around Lake Umatilla. We did make it in conference with the, and let's stop for just a second if we can. 
in conference with the Coast Guard, uh, we did make a decision to go around Lake Umatilla. There's very little there other than water and wind. And, of course, this is an impounded lake now, so the lake effects were causing four- to five-foot swells there, and there's really not any dugout uh, that's really capable of handling that on a regular basis, even one as fine as Mato Chante, the one that we're traveling in now. We can go ahead and continue. So we moved on down to the John Day Dam, and here you see Mount Hood, this imposing uh, feature here on the landscape that really shapes everything. Little Wolf there taking a look look down the Columbia River, knowing that he's close to home now, and the John Day Dam at night. Mount Hood again in the next morning, covered in snow, and there you see the river that we are about to continue on down as we make our way down toward the Dalles with Little Wolf in anticipation of going home. A traditional fishing scaffold there, which is really uh, something that people would be surprised how many there are on the rivers today, and the replica of Stonehenge near Mary Hill uh, State Park on the Washington side of the river. Coast Guard continuing to escort as we make our way down, and uh, these folks are hardworking each and every day. Salilo Falls before the dam, Salilo Falls after the dam. And uh, here we are now at uh, Wish Ram, where we had the opportunity to visit with some of the folks there, many of them Clickitat, and uh, there we're visiting with Wilbur, and we're going to meet Wilbur uh, in just a minute, so I guess in just a minute, he was involved in helping make this play possible, the young people and many of the town's folks there in Wishram, uh, telling the story of Lewis and Clark from multiple perspectives, not simply Lewis and Clark's perspectives, but the perspectives of the native people who called at home, and even incorporating a native story into that. And we continue on, paddling down the river as we make our way down to Horse Thief State Park, where the, we, this is the area known as the uh, Petroglyph Canyon. And uh, in this area, there are some of the finest uh, examples of uh, ancient, ancient American uh, uh, native rock art and, uh, and both uh, hieroglyphics and, and uh, uh, paintings, as well as, as carvings into the rock there. And this is just an example of some of the things that we're going to be able to put online for you as a resource in a much more extensive way. This is just a fraction. Some of them that are there, we were uh, treated to a very special tour back in the area there uh, to see some of the uh, just outstanding examples of uh, this, uh, these cultural artifacts that are expressed through this artistry of, of people many, many, many centuries before. And there you saw some of the flora and fauna there. So uh, I don't know if we can let that roll through, <laughs> but uh, we are indeed proceeding on. And uh, this morning, we are excited to be here at the, uh, the dam here at the Dalles. And uh, if we can pull out in here in just a minute, we're going to introduce our two guests that we're visiting with this morning. Uh, we are very, very pleased this morning to uh, be, actually have two hereditary chiefs of two of the, the tribes that called this area home. Uh, Wilbur Sloggish, who lives in Wishram, who is the hereditary chief of the uh, Klickitat, and Mr. John Jackson, who is the hereditary chief of the, uh, 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 of the um, Cascades uh, tribe. And we really appreciate them taking the time this morning. It's a little brisk out here sitting on top of the dam, but thank you, gentlemen, both of you for being here this morning. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Wilbur, for being well, here. That's quite all right. I have, to, be I have to say, before we get into this conversation, that we had the opportunity to, to visit with Wilbur at Wishram. He was involved in the play, and it wasn't until after the play that we had a chance to meet with him. But he came down and actually uh, had an opportunity to paddle in our canoe one day, and he's brought us salmon and tea and uh, and helped us to have a greater understanding of uh, the traditional people who called this area home. And I just would first of all like to say thank you for all your hospitality, Wilbur. It's been tremendous. Uh, it's quite all right. That's the way our people are. Indeed, and that's, uh, that's been an evidence both historically through the journals as well as what we've experienced here. We have been made to feel uh, just so very at home as we've made our way down here. And uh, the reason that these two gentlemen are here this morning is we want to find out more about the people who lived here. And not just about the people who lived here, but the practices of those people and how uh, those uh, historical details about this community continue today and the role that they play in this community today and issues that are of interest to them as we look back on the 200 years since uh, the first contact with Europeans really came to this area in a heavy way through Lewis and Clark and, and ultimate settlement of the West. Um, we're sitting on top of a dam right now at the Dalles, a uh, Corps of Engineers facility, which uh, helps to control uh, water flow on this river. It helps to manage uh, issues such as commercial trade, and there's a lot of, uh, of, of uh, uh, barges and all that travel through this area. But both of you, I guess, remember this area before there was a dam here. Yes. Very much. And I'd hazard to say that Mr. Jackson might even remember a little bit more than you, Wilbur. Yeah, he would. <laughs> 
Can you tell us, Mr. Jackson, a little bit about this area? Because you grew up literally pretty much in the in the shadow of where we're standing. Can you tell us a little bit more about what this area was like when you were a young man? When I grew up here, uh, I, I fished all over around here. And uh, below this dam here, we still have fishing sites. And over on the bluffs behind me, I used to have uh, three scaffolds over there. And I used to have a scaffold over there where that creek comes out. We didn't have to have a scaffold. We just fished off the rocks there. And uh, my uncle, Joseph Esterbrooks, lived uh, right where the bridge crosses. He had a house there. And we had uh, a few other houses there where my grandfather uh, lived. Uh, both of them lived there. Uh, uh, Peter Jackson, my dad's dad, and uh, my aunts lived there. We all lived there, and uh, it was it was called Wascopum. And uh, it was uh, last about the last uh, people that lived around there, from uh, the ones that uh, lived there when uh, Lewis and Clark and them first came down. That uh, place was called uh, Fort Dallas, where the city of the Dallas is now. It used to be a nine-acre uh, reservation, and uh, they told they used to, I used to listen to the people talk about it. And then uh, when uh, they uh, moved the people out, they moved with all the Wascos up to a reservation of Warm Springs, and. Uh, the others, they moved to Yakima. A lot of us didn't leave. Uh, a lot of the people didn't leave. They we moved, they went away, but they came back. And this was the uh, home of the Wasco people on this side. Spearfish was across the river where the Wishcom were. Up river was uh, the YM. The Klickitats were uh, across on the Washington side. They they roamed all over, uh, up and down that uh, car- corridor of uh, the Washington area, all the way up toward, uh, up the, way up the river, clear down to the Cascades. My father, he was uh, Cascade, Wasco, Klickitat, and uh, that's why I became the Cascade chief from uh, that my people put me in this place to where I stood up as a cook at that, and uh, Cascade Chief and uh, Wilbur, his dad was the last uh, click of that chief, and then he, it was passed down to him. And I, I stand as the Cascade Chief. But I grew up around these rocks here and lived on this side of the river. I used to come down, and when I wasn't going to school, I used to live down here with my uncle, Joe Esterbrooks. And... Uh, the Smith family from Warren Springs, they used, there was part of, we were all one family that used to come down here and fish here. And we fished uh, up and down this river. We used to go up this river with a boat, which I used to feel kind of nervous about, but my uncle knew how to run the boat, and we'd shoot the rapids all the way up to Tenino. We'd fish up there, run sturgeon lines, and people would fish off in scaffolds. We'd come down and we watched the people from uh, Spearfish fish off the bluffs on the Washington side. And we'd come back and we'd bring all the surgeon down and we'd butcher them there and I'd take them down to sell. But uh, my, uh, my dad, my grandfathers, and uh, my uncles, they used to fish on an island that's right under this dam here, part of it extended up the river. It was an island called Wasco Island. And we used to, uh, we used to, they used to go out there on a boat and cross, and they had uh, fishing sites on there where scaffolds were. They had uh, Indian names, the Wasco names of those uh, fishing scaffolds uh, that my dad, my, my dad, his dad, and his uncle and his brothers fished on. And uh, that's all underwater now. My dad came, when the, before the dam came in, they brought him up there. And he had to name the places and show them where the scaffolds were. 
and that was uh, that was that was the only time that I got to go on that island and uh, look at those fishing places, and then go back on a government uh, launch. But I fished uh, fished here just about all my life. Uh, in the summertime, I'd spend the most of my time fishing off in the bluffs on the uh, Oregon side over there, and then later on in the fall, then we'd move on up to Slalo, and we'd fish up there. We'd fish at Tenino and then move on up to Slalo. But I grew up fishing here, and we used to have, uh, my uncle used to have uh, sturgeon lines run clear across where that bridge is, above the bridge, we used to have sturgeon lines run clear across the Washington shore. And we used to have to run them lines. And sometimes, when I was uh, young, I was young then. And sometimes it'd be kind of scary, but we'd always, we'd always have to do it. And my life was, my life was fishing along this river here. And we had there was a lot of people uh, that uh, told stories about how the Dalles was a. Uh, a uh, little reservation. Uh, it was a village where the Dallas was before they made it a fort. And then uh, from there they made that the city, but they moved the people from the, the Wasco people from that area up to Warren Springs. Wasco people were all over along here on both sides, and the Wishcom were across the river, the Clickatats, and uh, Further on down were the Cascades. I live down that way now, as part of the Cascade, as the Cascade Chief. You're down by Underwood now, down across from Hood River. Yes. Uh, I had a question for you now. You've mentioned the, you know, being moved out of this area. You said that was like about 57 or the late 50s or something like that. Yeah. Well, I, and in, in moving people up on top, and I, this is one of the things we just want to try to share with people is we, you know, we've, we've passed across the country and we've spent time in in a, in a in you know many of the Plains tribes where the buffalo played an important role. But you know we've been talking a lot over the last several days about the role of the salmon. You talk about fishing, and I think that for a lot of people, obviously there's commercial fishermen out there, but for most people in this country, when they think about fishing, they thinking they're thinking about a Saturday morning and going out and and going fishing, and it's recreation. But that's not at all the case here, uh, neither historically or even in in the modern day for your people. No, it's a it's a major major source of food, and it, along with uh, income. So you know it, it's used in all of our ceremonies, uh, from birth to death to namings and uh, memorials. That's the first food, and we in the spring when when the first ones come back. We have a, a when the first one is caught, and then we have a salmon feast on it, giving thanks. I, I read in places there that we worship the salmon. No, we don't worship the salmon. We give thanks for their coming back because the renewal of our food source, and 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 uh, we give uh, worship the Creator for giving us these gifts, the gifts of the water, the gifts of the land, our roots, and the, and in the mountains, the berries. And also the 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 wild animals, you know, deer, elk, and and uh, the mountain goats, all of those things. You know, we gave thanks because they were here for not only for our food, but they were for use in 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 our clothing and our shelter in, in those days, and and blankets to keep us warm. Well, and so we're we're going to be talking in our in our next broadcast, our video conference this morning about the salmon. We're going to be talking about uh, the 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 fish uh, runs and the you know the things that are being done to help to restore the salmon. But uh, certainly, uh, unbeknownst to I, I, a lot of people, obviously probably were not aware of the impact it was going to have. But when the dams went in, it had an almost immediate effect uh, on your people, obviously, as that food supply was immediately impacted. Yes, yes, because they said that uh, a lot of the places would be flooded out, and as you, you can, the, that uh, tactic has been used again. There's some white marks on on the banks now, and they said the water was going to come that high, and uh, we're, our places were going to be flooded out again. And it seems to me that it was a, a government tactic to remove us because that's been the goal is, is the removal of our people from along this area, so that it can be used. Any way they don't have to worry about anything. We're not here to to exercise our our reserved right to to fish and and, and that. So 
uh, yes, it, it ha this dam has been a detriment to to a lot of the activities because you know we had beavers, we had beavers to, for flood control in the mountains, and they took care of that. And it's after the trappers came and decimated those, and then we lost our our, our flood control uh, system. And they think this is better, but. And all it does is warm the water, and, and fish need cold water. Now, the fish have, obviously, there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about the restoration of the of the salmon and all. You all literally live by by the run of the salmon. I mean, you, you, we've seen the Inlu sites. The Inlu sites are a series of places that have been established uh, through uh, federal efforts to make up for lands lost, fishing areas lost for native peoples here. Um, how do you see, I mean, do you see a uh, some improvement on the horizon? Do you see uh, some steps being taken at least uh, to, to try and, and uh, help restore the salmon? And what's your perspective on that? Because we're going to be talking about that a little bit later today. Well, they're, they're really using the hatchery system, but uh, they're not as uh, smart or mentally smart or, or capable of surviving. If you take any animal, the fish, the yes, fish, yes. yes. Like you take any animal and and put it in a a cage, and raise it and feed it, it's going to lose its instinct. It go to a zoo and and the lions and the tigers and all that they wait to be fed. So they do it when when they see a human, they think they're going to get fed. So so naturally they're going to go towards them because they're they're hand fed. But now I see that. Uh, they're also now using machines and automated system to put the food supply in it, but also they need to to uh, really take a look at what kind of a food they're putting into the fish, because a lot of times they're using uh, contaminated parts of, of animals to make these food pellets. They need to make sure that the, those uh, food sources for the salmon are clean, so that the fish will be a clean, healthy fish. Okay, well, we're going to continue this conversation. We've got, it looks like we've got a couple of questions. I know we're getting long on time here this morning. We've got a couple of questions for you. Um, one of the questions uh, from, uh, from one of our Internet viewers is, did the first people of the Columbia uh, River area have knowledge of canoes and canoe building uh, and among themselves in the whites? And we've talked a little bit about that, absolutely. And can you tell us a little bit about the canoes or what you remember, uh, maybe uh, yourself, Mr. Jackson, about when you were a young man about the canoe fishing? Well, uh, when uh, there wasn't uh, there wasn't uh, very many canoes or, or any uh, that I've uh, seen. I didn't see very many when uh, I was born and I was yeah, yeah, a young man around here. Uh that was when the that was when the automobile was uh we still had horses and uh a lot of them had buggies yet and uh they travel some of the people traveled that way but a lot of them had the Model A's and the Model T's and Chevys and uh and uh, they 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 were building boats then, uh, but uh, we would remind her. I used to hear I used to hear my uh, grandfather and them uh, talk about where they'd get the big cedars up uh, north somewhere, and they'd float them down to Columbia, and then they'd uh, they'd uh, burn and uh, uh, dig them out and cut them out uh, to make canoes. So they would actually bring the tree as a hole down and then make the canoe down here. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. And I do want to remind our viewers that uh, Mr. Jackson is an elder of the tribe, but, uh, but you know, he, as he mentioned there, he's not that old. They did have, they, they did have uh, uh, Model A's and some old Chevys running around. And I would also tell you that these guys have cell phones with them. They're living, and, uh, they, they're caught up in the same modern nonsense we are sometimes. But we appreciate you both being here this morning. Go ahead. Please finish. We had uh, people like the old man that lived behind that were behind me here's a uh, old house old man Jackson he had a horse and uh, and uh, a little buggy like a hack and he never did uh, like uh, automobiles and he used to he used to still use his horse and his uh, buggy or hack to go to town and back 
that's all he knew how to uh, travel with. Uh, when he'd go to town to do his shopping, he'd do, we'd, we'd watch him. He'd ride his, uh, he'd uh, harness his little uh, horse up and then he'd uh, ride to town with it and do his shopping. And he'd come back. He never, he never really believed in owning a car. Well, I don't believe in owning a motorboat either. I, I, I that's why I paddle a canoe. <laughs> they used to talk about. They used to talk about uh, another one of my elders. His name was Sam Williams. There was a Shaker church over here, and he used to come all the way from Woodriver on horse and buggy to that church to have uh, services on Sundays and go back. So we depended a lot. Uh, when we grew up, we when we were little, and we, uh, our uncles and our aunts over on the Washington side up where we lived with Wokaikas, they had a lot of wild horses. We used to watch them uh, chase the horses down. They depended a lot on the horses to go up the mountains. When we'd go up hunting or go up to the berry fields, we moved them horses up, the, up there on horseback. they take us two days to get there, but we still depended on a lot on the uh, a lot on our horses on that side of the river. I, we, we did have uh, canoes to if we went when we went down to uh, towards uh, the coast for trade. That's how we uh, we got the goods down there was by canoe to bring back the the, the shellfish, dried shell shellfish, and uh, cedar bark and and other goods that they had down there that we'd exchange for. That's how we got there was by canoe before. Those are the stories that were told uh, by our aunt. And it was a pretty extensive state, uh, uh, trade route. I mean, that's another thing that people really need to understand is how extensive this entire Snake River, Columbia River Valley, how rich and, and uh, developed this trade area was here. I want to thank both of these gentlemen for being here with us this morning. We're going to pr try to talk to them more and learn more about the Klickitat and the Cascades and the other tribes that have traditionally called this land home for many thousands of years. Uh, Mr. Jackson, I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today, and I hope that, I hope that we're going to have an opportunity to actually visit with you down at Underwood when we pass by there uh, today or tomorrow. And uh, also, Wilbur, again, I want to thank you for being here this morning and helping to remind people that, uh, you know, 200 years isn't that long, and uh, a lot of things have changed, but in, for a lot of people, things have stayed uh, in many ways the same, and we need to learn to respect those things and learn from those things. Is there any final thoughts that you'd like to have real quickly, uh, just to, uh, anything you'd like to say to people out there? Well... I'd like to uh, I'd like to uh, say that uh, our fish our fish our way of life is fishing, and that uh, I think that uh, it would be good if uh, the water wouldn't be so polluted, and that uh, we could build our runs up along these here lower rivers here, like where I live, where we're wanting to get a dam out where we can uh, build. Uh, a better fishery where we wouldn't have to have our fish going up through so much uh, polluted water and, and uh, it would be better for our people. That way I think our people would live longer. Those are great thoughts and that's that's good advice for all of us. I, I think that uh, a lot uh, of, of this modern science needs to understand that our people, our elder people, had good science and there was an abundance of everything when Lewis and Clark came. And we managed the resource good, and 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 it, there was an overabundance of everything, and and I think our science needs to be taken into consideration and understood. Absolutely, well said. We want to thank both uh, Mr. John Jackson, and Mr. Wilbur Sluggish, both for being here. The hereditary uh, uh, chief of, uh, respectively, the Cascade and. Uh, click tap tribes and we want to thank you all for joining us today there's going to be much longer interviews and footage available on our archived uh, portion of the site again send your questions and comments to us at lewis and clark at clayton.k12.mo.us and please stay tuned as we turn our attention here shortly to a video conference dealing most specifically with the salmon and maybe you've learned a little something here and you can uh, join us for that video conference via email and send your questions and comments based upon some of the information you learned here today again thanks for joining us for live with lewis for the 20 27th of October 2005, and uh, until we see you again in just a few minutes on our video conference, we proceed on. Peace and friendship.